Very happy to uh, welcome back uh, Jim Blen, who's one of our our famous uh, alumni, and uh, the Ski Institute is uh, uh, working with the School of Computing. Jim is mainly here to receive a Distinguished Alumni Award uh, tomorrow at, from the School of Computing. Uh, he will also be giving a talk there at 1 p.m., and that's located in uh, 1250 Warnock Engineering Building, so the first floor of this building in one of the, the large lecture halls. So if you'd uh, like to come back tomorrow, afternoon at one o'clock uh, and uh, a different topic yes <laughs> and uh, so different talk and we, we were able to get uh, Jim to come here today to uh, give a more technical talk on his hobby um, for those of you who don't know Jim Jim received his PhD uh, from the University of Utah in 1978 uh, and uh, has uh, a, a tremendous list of contributions in computer graphics just a few highlights, so SIGGRAPH uh, Achievement Award, the SIGGRAPH Coons Award, uh, MacArthur Fellowship, um, and the National Academy of Engineering, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a long list, which I think Ross will, will talk more about tomorrow at tomorrow's event. So I mainly want to turn uh, the floor over to, to Jim to talk about his hobby. So please let's welcome Jim back to the University of Utah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, going to try to cram an entire course in algebraic geometry into uh, about 50 minutes here. Uh, I'm going to do something different than was typically done, so uh, kind of set the stage, and there's a lot of really cool results that I'll just kind of show you uh, the results uh, at the end. Uh, this whole thing is motivated by, you know, the need uh, on my part to render 3D objects of various uh, first, second, third order, and higher, and uh, uh, rendering things, uh, for example, uh, when I worked at JPL, I drew a lot of spheres uh, with textures on them. And I wrote a special purpose program to do that because we had a PDP-11 with 64K of memory and polygonalizing it would have uh, not fit. So uh, the first step of the program was to calculate the ellipsoid of the uh, silhouette area. And then every uh, scan line it would calculate the intersection left and right with that and then go through and solve a quadratic equation at each pixel, look that up in the, in the texture map. And so that made uh, Jupiter, and that looked cool. Uh, next was Saturn, and that also looked cool. The rings is a separate program. And so here we are flying under the rings of Saturn, and flying under the rings of Saturn. And hey, where'd Saturn go? Well, <clears throat> what happened? When we look at Jupiter, look, you know, top view of the picture, uh, you know, we're looking uh, straight on it. And so the front view of the uh, of the sphere is an ellipsoid of some sort after the perspective transformation. But when we go to Saturn, we're looking off to the side to see the cool rings. And so now the plane containing the eye intersects the planet itself. And if you know about projective geometry, what that means is that the projection of the silhouette outline of that thing is a hyperbola, not an ellipse. And so if you don't recognize that in, in, in beforehand and, and look for that, then you're going to have the planet missing, which is always embarrassing. Uh, this actually was a... Uh, the hyperbolic silhouette thing was uh, mentioned to me by my thesis advisor, Mark Newell, when I was a graduate student here. And uh, unfortunately, I forgot about it until I got smacked in the face of it by trying to do animation. So what I'm going to talk about today is what's uh, a subset of, of mathematics uh, I've been focusing on, uh, classical real projective algebraic geometry. Classical means we're still talking about shapes. Nowadays, modern algebraic geometry kind of gets into very abstract things with uh, finite fields and weird, weird junk. We're actually talking about real shapes we can make pictures of, which is the, the term real. Uh, you know, mathematicians like to go into the complex domain, but uh, we're interested in real solutions to things because those show up on the screen. And uh, real is more complicated than complex. Projective geometry, as I just said, and algebraic geometry basically dealing with equations and the shapes that they generate. So the first major topic here is standard vector matrix notation that we use for uh, a lot of this stuff is not really good enough to, uh, to do everything that we want to do. Why is that? Well, 2D projective geometry uh, is done with 3D algebraic objects. Uh, we represent points as three numbers instead of two, uh, x, y, and w, homogeneous coordinates it's called. The pre to see where it actually is on the screen, you divide by the w. Uh, any non-zero scale or multiple of this whole vector still represents the same point. When you transform points, you multiply this three vector by a 
three by three matrix and you get the transform point. That's cool. Uh, if you want to find an equation of a line, um, different ways of writing that, that's the equation of a line. You can write it as a, uh, a uh, horizontal and vertical vector uh, using the machinery of uh, vector matrix multiplication and, uh, and that. So how do we transform lines? If we have a point lying on a line, that condition, we want to make it so we design the transformation so that the transform point also lies on the transformed line. In order to do that, we, we kind of splice in the middle a copy of the transformation matrix and its inverse, like that, which is the identity matrix, so that doesn't change anything. Then we kind of reassociate, and we see PT, which we know is the transform point, so that means that the transformed line must be the inverse of matrix pre-multiplied by the line. Okay? Uh, really, the, uh, the inverse of matrix is not necessary. That's kind of overkill. What we really want to use is the matrix adjugate. I used to call it the adjoint, but that's the wrong term. So in some of the early papers, if you see them, uh, replace adjoint with adjugate. Basically, the adjugate of a 3 by 3 uh, set of rows is the successive cross products of the ver you know, various columns like that. And the trick is, um, I'm using star to represent adjugate here, even though that's actually not typical notation, but I need a, a bit uh, of a uh, abbreviation there. So whenever you see something star, that means the adjugate. Um, so T times T star, if you work it up, you get a di diagonal matrix with the determinant on the diagonals. So uh, that is uh, a scalar times the identity matrix. And any scalar... Uh, Non-zero scalar multiples of anything pretty much represents the same geometric object all the time. So to reiterate, transform points by uh, point times matrix equals point, transform lines by the adjugate times the column vector, giving you the column vector of the line. Now let's look up, up one uh, quadratic uh, curve. We can represent the, the uh, quadratic thing by this uh, matrix uh, machinery that you've seen here. Um, Right away, we got something a little fishy here because we used to say that rows were points and columns were lines, and uh, this is one of the confusions that, uh, that we're going to actually fix up a little bit. Some people think rows are points and columns are lines. Some people think columns are points and rows are lines. It depends on what school you went to, but uh, I'm going to use rows be points. Um, so this is uh, P times Q times P transpose. Now, how do we transform uh, quadratics? We do the same sort of thing that we did for, for the lines. We uh, want to maintain these condition the point lies on the curve, and so we splice in a TT star here and the appropriate transpose if necessary, we associate, and that gives us the equation for how you transform a quadratic curve. We'll apply T star times Q times T star transpose. Um, how do you know if a, a line is tangent to a quadratic curve? I'll just hand you some results sometimes, they might be familiar already. You use the adjugate of the Q matrix in order to do that. That is, you, you multiply, um, the uh, line, uh, ABC, and on either side, and that gives you the equation that's zero. That means the line is tangent to the curve. And how do we transform the adjugate? Same sort of rigmarole here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we transform the adjugate by the T, not the inverse, so not the adjugate. So the idea here, uh, third thing is, how do we transform transformations? Suppose you know how to rotate around the origin. That's easy to do. But you want to rotate around some point up to the upper right here. So we first transform the point to the origin, then we rotate around the origin, and then we transform the point back again. So that is the adjugate of the translation times the rotation matrix times the translation again, giving you the transformed rotation. So what we really have is three different kinds of matrices, which the vector matrix notation doesn't kind of allow us to, uh, to see very easily. But you can see the differences between whether you've got an adjugate and a transpose on either side here, and it's a little confusing. Uh, but, so we're going to represent this as, uh, as tensors now. And uh, quote from my physical, uh, uh, theoretical physics professor at Michigan, uh, by their transformations, you shall know them. We have three different kinds here. One other thing about the, uh, the uh, vector matrix notation that's a nuisance is if we go up one order to uh, cubic curves, uh, we can kind of represent that as matrix vector things like this. But really, a, the, the coefficients of a cubic curve are best thought of as a 3 by 3 by 3 brick of numbers uh, where all the uh, coefficients are there. And so this, again, is kind of clumsy in matrix notation uh, like this. So the solution is we're going to steal some notational tricks from theoretical physics, in particular general relativity and quantum mechanics. Since I have a physics background, I kind of think in those terms. And 
this is uh, tuned for use in projective algebraic geometry. Tensors are used in a lot of different things to represent stress and, ge and so forth. I'm just interested in the uses of tensors, just the machinery of it, to represent algebraic geometry situations. So we used to have rows and columns. We had row vectors and column vectors. Now we're going to have, instead, things called contravariant and covariant indices. And we, we run the contravariant indices as sub superscripts. They're not, they're not exponents. They're actually just a place to put a, an index to distinguish it between covariant and contravariant. And so the new multiplication machine is uh, if you want to uh, dot the product the P with the L, you have uh, the superscript uh, number and the subscript number, and those get summed over. That's, that's a, uh, a dot product, which is called a tensor contraction. And you can uh, write that as the um, summation over I of uh, PI and LJ, one up and one down. Uh, then the, also you do even more, more, uh, more uh, abbreviation. Uh, if you ever see something with the same letter on the up and down, that assumes that there's going to be a summation to that. And so this is called Einstein index notation. You see that a lot in uh, general relativity diagrams. So what do the three kinds of matrices look like this way? The uh, rotation translation matrix is a, what's called a mixed tensor. It's got one up and one down. The Q that represents a quadratic is called a pure covariant. That's got two down indices. And the uh, adjugative Q is called pure contravariant because that's got two up, up uh, things. Now, in general, you can have more complicated tensor expressions. This is something that I just kind of made up. And uh, the idea here is whenever you see the letters appear twice, like uh, you can see uh, K and, and K here, that means there's a summation over K. And there's a J and a J here, summation over J. L uh, doesn't get summed with everybody, so that sticks around in the result. And what else we got? Um, U, there's a U and a U, a little hard to follow. And so we want to do a little, something a little bit cleverer than this. What we're going to do is come up with a new way of writing this tensor contraction that uh, makes everything a lot easier to keep track of. That is, whenever we have a tensor contraction like that, we're going to write it like this. That is, the point-like thing is a node, and the line thing is another load, node, <clears throat> and the arrow represents the summation over the alpha there. So uh, this uh, previous thing that was a little hard to follow is now at least somewhat easier to follow. K and U and uh, J, you can see, are immediately summed. And you've got I and L and M left over. And once you do it in this uh, diagram notation, it turns out you don't need to bother with the indices anymore because they're just kind of temporary variables. And so the diagrams that we're representing, uh, I'm showing you here, uh, this represents basically three summations because you've got three connected arrows. And uh, that's kind of uh, what we're going to play around with. The one thing we have to be careful of is the, the dangling arcs, which are called, uh, wind up calling free indices in the business, uh, have to be kind of pointing in the same direction to, so you can keep track of what, where they came from. So let's take the three kinds of matrices and uh, take a look at uh, how they work with uh, uh, plugging in points. Uh, the transformation matrix, say P, uh, plug in a point uh, to the transformation here. You get summation over J, and so you plug in a point into the transformation, and you get a point out. The uh, idea is that whatever is left over on this side is left over on the, on, on the output. We, I take a dot product of a P with, uh, with the uh, Q, and there's a, a common I there, and you get a line out. So point plugged into Q. Again, the arrows keep the bookkeeping for you uh, correct, so you have an arrow out. So the result of that is a line. And uh, a line times the Q star gives you a point. And uh, what that means geometrically uh, for the last two is this is called the, uh, the um, polar point of, of a quadratic respect to a line. That is, plug a point, uh, point into Q, and you get the line here. And that's the line where you can see the uh, silhouette outline intersects the curve. If the point happens to be on the curve, the line, the line becomes the tangent, and if the point is inside the curve, you get something outside. And then dually, if you take the uh, Q uh, star and multiply a line in it, by that, you get the point back. And so this gives you uh, uh, polar points and polar lines, again, keeping track of the uh, indices properly. Uh, for a point on a quadratic curve, we add uh, this new diagram then to our notation. That is, we have a point plugging in on either side of a Q, and so that's the notation for plugging in the point twice into Q. 
point on a cubic no, uh, curve. Again, uh, this would be, uh, represent this three by three by three brick of numbers as a triply indexed tensor. And you've got a, a three summations like that, but the, uh, the uh, diagram version of that is just three p's plugged into the uh, C. Uh, the general transformation rule is when you have a point uh, times transformation, you get another point, and here's a T star plugging into L. And if you're transforming a, uh, a Q, a, a thing with inward pointing arrows, you use T star on either side. And then if you want to do a transforming cubic curve, again, you have pointing, inward pointing arrows on C. So then you plug a T star in that. So the general rule is if you have some strange complicated diagram with arrows sticking in and out of it, every time you see an inward arrow, you plug in a T star. And every time you see an outward arrow, you plug in a T. And that will give you the equation for the transformed version of the thing. Now it's two generalizations to different dimensions. We did uh, project two space with uh, three vectors. Going down one dimension is uh, kind of simple, simpler somewhat. Uh, the P1 space, projective one space, represents points as 2D lines through the origin. Uh, so any point on, say, this uh, line here except the origin represents the same point in space. And one way of doing that is if we divide out the W, that's like intersecting it with a straight line. But then we have points at infinity on the left and right side, which would be represented by the horizontal line there. And so uh, sometimes it's easier to represent uh, that as, as just taking a, a circular cross section of the uh, set of rays there. And that gives a, a negative point of infinity going to minus zero, plus zero, up to the positive infinity. And then it kind of wraps around again. But topologically speaking, uh, a semicircle in this space turns into a complete circle here. It wraps around infinity uh, the appropriate way. Uh, 360 degrees around here gives you uh, the uh, whole number line twice effectively, which uh, you have to kind of think of sometimes. In P2 space, same thing is now uh, representing that in three dimensions is points going through the origin. Again, you intersect that with the W equals one plane and that gives you the points that you would want to plot. Another way of looking at that is to take a semi, have a sphere intersecting that because anything in the W equals zero plane represents a point at infinity. So that's the line at infinity. And looking down on top of that, this uh, point up here is the same as this point like that. Uh, this point F is the same as that point there. So this thing kind of folds together in a kind of an interesting way. And this is a picture I made actually for Rich Riesenfeld in a paper that when I was a graduate student. This is a topological representation of this thing which is called a projective plane. Uh, this point right here is the origin. Here's the y-axis going down here into this groove. Here's the x-axis coming around here into this groove. This uh, self-intersection region here represents the line at infinity and it intersects itself because we can't uh, do that in the three dimensions without you know, having that happen. But you kind of get a sense of this. It's basically a giant Mobius uh, band, but it's more like Mobius space in a sense. So the basic uh, thing that I've been playing around with then is here's the grid. We have each column represents a different uh, dimensionality, project one, two, and three space. And each line repre uh, represents a different order of polynomial. So we're just going to go through and quickly and, and show how those are. Points in uh, the space are two, uh, two and three and four vectors. And we represent that as a, uh, a node with an arrow sticking out of it. Uh, sometimes it, when we mix uh, two and three dimensions and so forth, I'll have to distinguish between uh, a two-dimensional uh, summation and a three-dimensional summation. And I will kind of alert you when that happens using either dotted lines or fat lines. I haven't come up with something I like all the time. Um, different uh, dimensionality of a first order thing is uh, uh, first, uh, first uh, order like this. Uh, again, I'm using, you know, re relating this to the old style notation just for uh, educational purposes. It's the same diagram for all three of these things, uh, but with bigger and bigger matrices, uh, vectors and matrices. Uh, different orders are uh, Lin linear and quadratic and cubic and quartic and so forth, more and more coefficients. Uh, you can represent those as uh, bigger and bigger bricks of numbers. Linear is uh, one vector. Uh, quadratic is uh, two by two. Cubic is a two, by, a three, a two by two by two. Quartic is a uh, hyper thing. Anyway, each of those is represented by this, the proper number of arrows pointing into the 
node that represents the tensor for the polynomial. Uh, again, going across this diagram here, uh, the uh, diagram version of that is the same, but uses fatter and fatter matrices, a quadratic uh, polynomial here, a quadratic curve, quadratic surface, uh, just uses bigger things. Now, likewise, transformations, uh, the notation is the same across dimensions, but again, using uh, bigger and bigger matrices as we go up dimensions. Uh, let me stick in one other thing. We've been talking about implicit uh, curves and surfaces so far. I'm going to show uh, how we do uh, parametric surfaces uh, and, and curves and surfaces in this notation. Uh, here's the implicit thing. Implicit, uh, formula for a line is basically just a node with an arrow pointing into it. That's a line. A parametric line, is, you can think of it as a linear combination of two points. And as you adjust alpha and beta up and down, it's going to move the point back and forth across here. So we can write that in uh, standard vector matrix notation by turning alpha beta into a, a, a two, two element vector. And then this now becomes a two by three tensor. So the diagram notation uh, for that would be a parameter node with a two uh, dimensional thing plugged into a uh, thing. So this uh, vector V here is uh, that. It's a two by three uh, tensor as you adjust P up and down, then it spits out the parameters. Parametric quadratic curve uh, basically has x, y, and uh, w the quadratic functions of some parameter. I cleverly switched from alpha and beta to s and t for the parameters because I'm mixing slides from different talks here. Um, so this is a way of representing that as in standard diagram notation. It's going to be a 2 by 2 by 3 brick of numbers. And the diagram uh, notation like this is P plugged in here twice. And this is a, a, a two-dimensional uh, uh, summation giving you a 3D thing out. So here's a, one of the diagrams with 2D and 3D things in the same thing giving you the final point. So as you go up in different orders of parameter curves, we have what we just saw linear and uh, quadratic. And here's a, a uh, cubic, same thing. It's uh, each x, y, and w is a cubic function of uh, the, uh, the parameter here, which it's thrown by three arrows plugged into here. So this is basically mapping uh, P1 space, which is this circle, into P2 space, which is this projective plane. Uh, orders of parametric surfaces uh, does this basic upper dimension. That is, you plug in uh, 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 a three-dimensional thing uh, into this thing, which is a three by four matrix. Each, each row of this E would be a four vector representing a point uh, in the plane. And uh, so this is going to be a three by four tensor, plug in different values for that. And so this maps P2 space, that is our projective plane, into P3 space, which is a three dimensional projective plane. Um, what's interesting is if you go up one order for that, that is, say, say instead of going for linear, you go to quadratic, that is basically just two P's plugged into this thing. That means each of X, Y, Z, and W is a quadratic function of uh, X, Y, Z parameter. <coughs> then you get what's called a Steiner surface. And it's not second order, it's actually fourth order. And that's a kind of a fun thing to play around with because Steiner surfaces explodes into this incredible con uh, uh, conglomeration of, of uh, weird shapes. Uh, this is us cribbing some pictures from uh, Kaufman's paper in I think it was 1996. And he um, kind of helped start categorizing this thing, but uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of helps even further doing that. And you'll notice uh, this shape right here was the one that we did for the projective plane uh, that I made for Rich. Um, and when you think about it, you go back, uh, this is uh, showing a mapping from uh, the projective plane into a shape in three dimensions. So all of these things basically are representations of the projective plane. And, but this is the one that's kind of easier to see what's going on. But there is each one of these things is basically a projective plane uh, points in that kind of spread out over space. As uh, special cases of that uh, with some singularities, you get uh, various uh, cubic uh, surfaces and further specialization, you get all the quadratics and uh, you can all go down to linear by various degeneracies. Now there's two ways to do this uh, parametric 3D thing. You know, this is kind of the way that mathematicians do it, projecting P2 into P3, the projective uh, uh, plane into P3. Uh, what we do in computer graphics more is kind of to separate out these two things. And we, instead of having two 
identical three-dimensional things going into a, a tensor. We do two things, two-dimensional things going into a tensor where um, this, this red summation, uh, if you vary this P up and down, that'll trace out uh, these red lines. And if you uh, wiggle this, this P and the blue thing up and down, those will generate the, the two lines. And so that's basically mapping P1 cross P1 into P3. This is a kind of a different uh, set of things you can get. Uh, and I haven't played around with this too much uh, as yet, but uh, just to see bicubic patches, which is our great love in computer graphics, this is going to look like something like this. That is uh, a cubic uh, thing along one parameter direction and another cubic thing along another parameter direction. So this is going to be a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 4 brick of numbers. And uh, that actually, uh, I think Tom Sederberg was able to prove that that can actually generate 18th order surfaces. And I'm still working on seeing if I can prove that with this notation, but I haven't gotten there yet. Um, cross products. Uh, two points make a line, and so we should be able to calculate that. Um, those of you who have seen this before realize that the way to do it algebraically is to take the cross product of the uh, two uh, row vectors, and I'm writing that as a column vector, which is, we like column vectors for lines, and uh, so forth. And so you can get the, the line out given two points. Uh, dually speaking, you take two points, uh, uh, two lines, and those make a point. So this two by three thing uh, gives you that. How could we represent that as diagrams? What we do is we invent yet another tensor, which is called in the business epsilon, sometimes called the Levi Civita epsilon. And this is a three by three by three brick of numbers, mostly zeros. And it's, it's designed so that uh, if the subscripts uh, are like one, zero, one, two, or two, uh, zero, one, so forth, it's an even permutation of these numbers. It's a plus one. If it's an odd permutation, it's a minus one. And otherwise, it's a zero. So this epsilon tensor looks explicitly like that. And it's designed so that when you, oh, we, we use this so often that we further represent that as basically a dot. So anytime you see a dot, that's the epsilon tensor. And so if you look at the uh, indices, we have an upper and down thing, an upper and down thing. So you have two uppers plugged into this thing, gives you something with a down. So you get point and point gives you a line. And the diagram version of, like, of this looks like that. Again, you get a thing with an arrow coming in because of the direction of that. Uh, so this has a co and a contravariant thing here. Two points generate a line, and two uh, lines generate a point. This is an inward arrow thing, and this is an outward arrow thing. Now, how does uh, epsilon look in different dimensions? Now we get something uh, much different. In 4D algebra, projective three space, the epsilon has four indices, and in uh, projective geometry, one dimensional projective geometry, it has two indices. So let's look at the 2D one first. Uh, basically, the 2D epsilon is very simple. It's just a two by two matrix, uh, same rules of uh, even an odd uh, permutations of the uh, subscripts. And that's designed, again, so that uh, taking the uh, epsilon product of these uh, two things gives you uh, this expression here, which is kind of like a one dimensional cross product. And so the diagram version of that uh, looks like this. And uh, a reason that I wrote this thing uh, in that kind of shape is so that we can keep track of this thing because P uh, with, uh, epsilon s is going to be minus s represent, uh, epsilon represent p. If, if you switch these things around, you get them uh, flipped around. And so this a asymmetry of the diagram helps us keep track of the asymmetry of the, uh, the matrix. Uh, uh, p, uh, epsilon p is uh, identically 0. Uh, if you take two epsilons glued together like this, you get uh, minus one times uh, the identity. Uh, so if you flip one of those things around, the yeah, trick here is that if you have a diagram and you mirror image an epsilon, you flip the sign of the diagram. Or if you mirror image an odd number of epsilons, you flip the sign. So for example, here we can show immediately that the uh, plug an epsilon into the Q gives identically zero because you can take this thing, take a mirror image of it, it's minus that. So thing equals minus thing must equal zero. Or if you take a ring of things like that, again, at three epsilons, you mirror image that, you've got an odd number of epsilons, so that's identically zero. And in fact, if you have even a different thing here, uh, that's also identically zero. Now let's take a look at the adjugate and the determinate kind of explicit forms in uh, two by two matrices. Uh, the adjugate of a two by two matrix like this is uh, that, 
which you can sp uh, spread out is to uh, epsilons times the original matrix times epsilon. And so just kind of brute force, we kind of see that uh, the adjugate of this matrix is uh, an epsilon plugged on either side of it, one covariant and one contravariant. And I highlighted those with colors to keep track of them a little bit more easily. Uh, so if you plug M into this thing, uh, just algebraic, well, you try it out and, and see, yep, sure enough, it makes the identity times the determinant of the uh, original AD minus BC. And uh, now let's try something else. We're going to take this arrow here and connect it over here to that. Uh, that's a legal thing to do, and that gives you basically the trace of this matrix, summation over the di uh, diagonals. And sure enough, that gives you two times the determinant of the matrix. And uh, if you unravel this thing a little bit, I do a lot of diagram things and then twisting the arrows around to make the thing prettier. So twist this around here, it looks like that. And to make it even prettier, I will typically flip the direction of this thing just for aesthetics. And so this diagram here represents minus, because we flipped it, two times the determinant of M. Uh, again, uh, for a mixed tensor, like a 2 day by transformations, we have a covariant and contravariant. For a pure tensor, you can, it's exactly the same thing, except they're both the, the same uh, arrow direction. Now let's go up to three dimensions. We already saw that. The line through two points, for example, is uh, that. Uh, this, again, is also anti-symmetric, because if you mirror reflect uh, this thing, it flips the sign of it. Uh, if you plug a third point into this thing, this gives you what's called a scalar triple product, which uh, uh, is also uh, the determinant of the three row vectors here. Sometimes that's denoted just like this, if you see it sometimes in the literature. That's the scalar triple product of the row of vectors R, S, and T. Um, the adjugate of a matrix, uh, I'm handing you these things, looks like this. And the determinant of the matrix uh, looks like this, and it's minus 6 times the determinant of T, because some constant values uh, always uh, fit in here. So this is the adjugate and the determinant. Uh, now we go up to four dimensions. Four dimensional epsilon is this god awful thing, 4 by 4 by 4 by 4, mostly zeros strategically placed minus ones for this, uh, this same sort of thing. And we're going to write that as this matrix here, or this diagram here. There's little tick marks sticking out on here, which is a detail which I won't, uh, I'll gloss over for right now. Uh, but uh, just to show what's going on, uh, 40,000 foot view. So the way the 4D epsilon works is, if you plug in three points to it, arrows out, that gives you a line, uh, a line, or a plane now, a plane with it. So this gives you uh, the plane through those three points. If you plug in just two points, what you get is a, uh, a basically an anti-symmetric matrix. It, it's, the elements of it look like this. And uh, so we'll write that also as a, as a, a triangular thing to be uh, keeping anti-symmetry visually as well as a thing. And so that generates uh, the line, representation of line going the, through those two points. If you want to have a point and a line, and plug the point into the line, that gives you the plane common to the point in the line. The whole thing works dually as well. That is, you plug uh, three planes into uh, the outward pointing epsilon, that gives you the point of intersection. Uh, if you plug in just two planes, that gives you the line of intersection. And if you plug a plane into a, uh, into a line, that gives you the point of intersection. It turns out, you know, you can see that we have two different kinds of line matrices here. And if you take uh, S and T, you get, uh, or M and N, which represent the same line, these two matrices are going to be different uh, subtly. They're actually the same values, but arranged differently. And so you can convert those back and forth between each other by plugging them into epsilon. And also identically, uh, this particular diagram is identically equal to zero for any lines that you have generated by one of these things. I'm not going to go into detail on this because I've written a bunch of stuff on that, which I can point you to if you're interested. Now, here's an interesting thing about this. Suppose you take uh, two different lines in space and you plug this in there. If that value is non-zero, then those turn out to be skew lines. They don't intersect. But the condition of two lines in, intersecting in space is that k uh, epsilon thing is equal to zero. We'll come back to that in a little bit. 4D epsilon, the adjugate and the determinant are kind of the generalization of what we did before. Let me talk a little bit about the history of diagram notation. The first time I was introduced to it was uh, Jim Kajia found this book, and he pointed me out to it because he knew I liked visual things, uh, Diagram Techniques and Group Theory. And I actually understood like the first chapter in the book. And that gave me the inspiration for this. The rest of it, I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, 
But it turns out that uh, this has been around off and on for some time. The earliest paper I know of uh, is 1878, written by Sylvester and Clifford. Uh, was interesting because Sylvester uh, started out the paper in this kind of chatty way that they do in mathematics. I was having uh, lunch with my friends in the chemistry department the other day, and I wanted to figure out some way of showing him what I was doing in a way the chemists would understand, like with a bunch of circles with lines in between them. <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, Sylvester's paper was a little bit too enamored with that because he said, you know, a quadratic matrix is actually an oxygen made out of oxygen and a cortex is made out of carbon and so forth. Um, so, Sylvester and Clifford uh, communi uh, communicated back and forth on that. A few years later, a guy named Kempe wrote some papers that did this a little bit more, and uh, I haven't found much. In 1989, there's a good paper by Oliver and Shackerban, husband and wife team, uh, and I'm going to show some of the results of that in a second here. And then Stedman's book that I learned this stuff about, and I've been playing with this thing from, since 1992. And uh, another guy that I communicated with, uh, Jürgen Richter Gebert in Germany, has played around with a little bit as too. Uh, but it's kind of an old notation. But the problem with, with Sylvester's thing here is that there's an ambiguity in it. And uh, one other interesting thing about this, in fact, was <clears throat> Sylvester talked about molecules and so forth. And he, it turns out that in 1878, the existence of molecules in the real world was not a foregone conclusion. Physicists didn't really think that molecules existed, atoms existed then. They were just a mathematical abstraction. It wasn't until, like, uh, was it? Uh, 1905, when some guy wrote this paper about Brownian motion, that actually that was experimental evidence that uh, atoms is, uh, existed. So <clears throat> the problem with Sylvester's notation is that he represents this thing with just a line, which uh, what I'm representing with you know this epsilon tensor. And so if you uh, rotate it, you don't uh, keep track of the fact that, you, or if you mirror it, you don't keep track of the fact that it changes sign. And so he had some difference with signs. Oliver and Shackerban tried to improve that by using a, an arrow instead of a line. And again, that works OK for rotation, keeping track of which one's which. But mirror images, again, get confused. So the, the nice thing about this uh, diagram notation is that uh, this asymmetrical thing, uh, you can rotate things around. That doesn't change the meaning of the, uh, and, and translate them. That doesn't change the meaning. But <clears throat> if you f do a mirror image, it changes the sign. Uh, you might also see uh, diagrams from you know, Penrose's di uh, book. Uh, this is a different dialect, basically, where he says the upper indices be sticking out of the top of the thing, the lower indices sticking out of the bottom of the thing. He has different things that he's emphasizing. Feynman diagrams have a, some relationship to that, too. But here are the two most important things about tensor diagrams. Number one is uh, we start out saying uh, basic linear relationship between vectors in three dimensions. <clears throat> we know that if we have... Uh, any vector that it can be a combination of three basis vectors. In other words, any four vectors are not linearly independent. And it turns out if you play around with this a little bit, you can find that the uh, coefficients are actually uh, written in diagram notation look like this. And this is sometimes called a grassman plucker relationship. It's related to Kramer's rule and so forth. But note that each element of this thing has the same number of nodes and the same number of arcs, they just connect together differently. So this is a kind of fundamental uh, thing that's true of any four vectors in space. It's, you know, their one can be represented as the uh, linear combination of the others. So that leads to something called the arc swapping identity. Here's the thing we just did before. I'm going to rearrange them a little bit to put all of the uh, things in the same place on the diagram. And it looks like this thing is equal to this thing with this arc swapped here, and this arc swapped here, and this arc swapped here. So what that means is, if you have some more complicated diagram, then you can basically do uh, manipulations on that by taking this thing and swapping it with the various things. And you take this thing, whatever it represents, this is a you know, polynomial of some sort, that is equal to these three polynomials. Now, in different dimensions, the arc swapping uh, identity <coughs> uh, looks a little bit simpler in two dimensions. Again, it's uh, you're swapping an input, one, one uh, arc, with the two things on, on an epsilon. In four dimensions, it's a, a little fancier, but basically because there's four, four arcs coming into the epsilon. And so you have yet four terms coming out. So this allows you to do, uh, do calculations by this. Here's a little video, which I hope I can figure out how to start. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Please play video. There we go. Um, so we're going to start out by um, yeah. we're going to start out by identifying which arcs we're going to swap by making them uh, making them colored. And uh, first of all, we uh, wait, wait, oh, come on. This is the one thing I didn't rehearse. There we go. Um, we're going to do a cut and paste of uh, two different copies of that thing, and um, Put in an equals and a plus too, because that's what we're going to uh, represent uh, as the final result, because this is a two-dimensional thing here. Now we zoom in and we do a, a, a swap between uh, this arrow and that one, that arrowhead, and then we go back and we do a swap between uh, that same arrowhead and the other one down here, and we get you know two different diagrams, and. Uh, now we back up again, and you know, they've gotten a little bit uh, garbled, and so we're going to go through and, and tidy things up a bit. Um, we can move this down here. I use a program called Visio, which is nice because it you know, lets you move things around and keep them connected like that. And so if we select this chunk here like that, we can uh, rotate it around without changing the value of it. And since the C uh, is connected, it's kind of hidden now, so I'm going to pretty up that connection a little bit. Since C is symmetric, we can plug it in any time here. And now uh, I'm going to pause. Damn. Well, I'll give you the punchline, otherwise I can go here all day. Um, the first term that we wind up on the left-hand side turns out to be minus the whole uh, right-hand side, which turns out to be minus the whole left-hand side. We move that over the equal sign, so now we get 2 times what we start out with here. And let me put this back into... Uh, Anyway, 2 times this equals that. Now this uh, here, which I'm now no longer able to draw on. I'm trying to do this so that the people uh, not in the audience can see what I'm drawing. And I'm trying to remember what. There we go. Now this is falling apart into two disjoint sections. Now remember, this represents a polynomial. You can tell the polynomial is uh, third order in the elements here, and it's fifth order in the uh, X, Y, W, and uh, this represents one polynomial. This is another. What we've done is basically taken this horrible polynomial and we factored it. And so that's a neat thing about uh, this thing. Uh, these are called syzygies in the business. But you notice that either on either side you have the same number of P's, C's, and epsilons. They just connect together differently. So a few uh, <clears throat> other fairly simple uh, derivations of this arc swapping that identity give you uh, some other kind of higher order identities, which uh, I'm going to sort of catalog here. Uh, the epsilon delta rule, as it's called. And uh, notice that uh, there's what I call conservations of epsilons to any of these things. And epsilon out starts as plus one epsilon. Epsilon arrows in starts as minus one epsilon. And so the total number of epsilons, uh, you know, the particles and antiparticles, so to speak. And uh, so here's another couple of diagrams representing the uh, 3D thing, which we did before. And this is now a 2D uh, epsilon by just erasing this and turning that into a 2D epsilon. Likewise, there's a thing between 4D and 4D. But here's the important identity about this thing now. Let's see, we want to transform the epsilon tensor itself. We plug in a transformation on either side, the thing, the thing, and a little bit of epsilon uh, arc swapping thing. And we can prove that that equals this thing times that. Again, you can see uh, there's three epsilons here, but plus minus one and so forth. So uh, this is equal to that. In other words, when you transform the epsilon, it comes back the same, except scaled by some scalar factor. Why is that interesting? Let's take a look at our quadratic thing here. And 
plug in a transformed Q, which I just circled here so you can see uh, what it is. And now we uh, reassociate it again, and we notice that this is a transformed epsilon on either side. So this transformed diagram turns into determinant squared times that, which is something called the weight in the, in the, in the business. So it means that <clears throat> if we take uh, this diagram here and transform the Q, we get the same diagram back again, maybe with some scalar multiple. So that means that of all the weird polynomials you can make out of the coefficients and the x, y, and z, and some w, tensor diagrams ex express exactly those that represent transformationally invariant quantities. So each tensor diagram set to zero gives you some interesting geometric information about the object. Um, so uh, what I call the algebra of tinker toys, that is you, you, you get some, uh, some tensors and you kind of plug them together different ways. You can just generate as many invariants as you like. For example, if you uh, plug these together like this, you get what's called the Jacobian of Q and C, also known as the first transvectants. You have the great numbers from this classical algebraic geometry, uh, great names from classical algebraic geometry. Plug uh, the thing in with two epsilons, and that's called the second transvectorant, or the apolar covariant, blah, blah, blah. They, they have all these names, but they're all just diagrams. Uh, an interesting aspect of this thing is the trace of the matrix. You did this before, it took the trace of a transformation matrix, which is legal because you're for a transformation, you're plugging an, an outward to an input arrow. Um, why is the trans trace interesting? I mean, you know, they tell you trace of a matrix is the sum of the diagonals. Okay, fine. So what? Why is that an interesting thing? Because, at least in this case, the trace is a transformationally invariant quantity. And that being zero tells you something about the geometry of the matrix. And I only figured that out 10 years ago after you know, being out of school for a long time. Now, what do we take the trace of, of the quadratic matrix? That's got two lower indices. That doesn't work. That's not a legal thing in this thing. That's because the way we transform tra quadratics, the trace of this thing is not an invariant quantity. You can take a quadratic thing that has a positive trace and transform it and get a, another quadratic uh, with a, a negative trace. And so uh, the arrow thing kind of gives you that. Um, now, I have a bunch of kind of applications of this thing which I can kind of go on and, and do. Uh, I can stick as long as, as long as we have room and, and people are interested. And uh, as I say, I hope I can get to the good juicy stuff. Here's one that I've kind of had fun with. Let's see if we can understand 2D transformations. Uh, that's got four numbers in it. And we can actually take those four numbers and plot those as points in 4D homo uh, projector three space, 4D homogeneous coordinates. Just pretend A, B, and C, D, or X, Y, Z, and W, and, and see what the shapes are. So the uh, interesting things here are the trace and the determinant. And this is the uh, discriminant of the, uh, of the characteristic equation. It tells you if you have positive and uh, or real or imaginary eigenvalues. And if you plot those things in 3D, you get a thing that's kind of a little confusing. And after playing around with this a little bit, I came up with a different uh, uh, transformation that uh, just took that, those same say, sh three shapes and put them in a way that we can understand what it looks like that. Here is a roadmap of all possible 2D transformation matrices. This is projective space now. So we've got three dimensions here. And there's, you know, using like the, uh, this one is the W coordinate here. So the identity is right here, the apex of this cone. Uh, the hyperboloid is all singular matrices. And the cone is all um, matrices with, a, uh, uh, with two equal eigenvalues. And this uh, plane here is <coughs> uh, matrices with a zero trace. And those are uh, involutions in the 2D anyway. Multiply it by itself, you get the identity there, their own inverse. Uh, I'm also going to do a kind of cross-section of this thing. Now let's relate that to the uh, invariance of the thing. Uh, there's like three invariants that you can do, and uh, they actually are related to each other by arc swapping. So you can take the square of this, and the, uh, the uh, eigen, uh, characteristic equation thing is actually the sum, and the trace squared is the difference of these things. So you can take any two of those things and plot. Actually, we're going to plot all three of them here. Uh, uh, the, the vertical axis is the square of the trace, and the horizontal axis is this lowercase delta. This diagonal is the singular matrices, and this is one where these, the uh, trace of the square is zero. And now let's relate that back to, also, also, incidentally, this is kind of a homogeneous thing because if you scale t by something, all of these go up and down by the same amount. So we're really only talking about a, a, a one parameter thing here, which is kind of like the angle through here. Although, uh, this origin is still a valid matrix, not quite the same as a projective geometry. And so here's how we relate these two. 
basically uh, the point down here represents all points in this whole new space. It means all, everybody's going to go singing now, right? Um, okay. And I'm not sure how long I should go because I've got hours worth of stuff here. But let me just finish this one, this, this one thing and, and see how. Yeah, OK. <laughs> it's OK. Um, this is a cross section of the cone here, which I would do down here for, for uh, reference. But all points on, along this thing, all points basically on the outside of this thing, which are red, are the same shape by the fact that one can be transformed into another by the transformation matrix. And this is the, the kind of signature of that shape. The trace is equal to zero. As we go to slightly different matrices, you get something up here, and this, this, uh, this uh, disk with a hole in it uh, opens up into an ellipsoid, sweeping it, uh, sorry, hyperboloid sweeping it around here. And so each point on this thing represents uh, all of the things on that particular ellipsoid. And because anything on that ellipsoid can be transformed into each other. Uh, likewise, singular matrices along here represent this, uh, sorry, hyperboloid, I just keep saying. Uh, this hyperboloid here, they're all singular matrices are the same in this case. And, uh, whoops. And um, up here is the identity and uh, the things with equal eigenvalues. Uh, uh, and so uh, anything along this cone is the same, the identities. So this is not completely unique here, because this point here represents kind of two different matrices. So there's a little bit more that we have to do. And down here, we get into things basically rotation matrices, imaginary eigenvalues. And each point on here represents a now a, uh, an ellipsoid. As we get further down, we get you know, smaller and smaller ellipsoids and so forth, until we get down to this uh, line here. So this point represents all of those. Uh, things down there. So you kind of get a sense of the geometry of things. This is called a foliation in the business, by the way, in case you've heard of it. Uh, let me just go on a little bit, <clears throat> uh, if you don't mind. Looking back at Kempe's uh, 1885 uh, paper, using his uh, diagrams that are kind of ambiguous, uh, but he knew about uh, the fact that here's a, here's a cubic polynomial, and that's what we represent here. Here's the discriminant of that, which is we represent now kind of correctly with the, this diagram. It's a quarter function of the coefficients of the cubic. This diagram here is identically zero. And we can see that here by seeing a you know, mirror reflection, you know, thing equals minus thing, so that must be equal to zero. Uh, here's a quartic. Uh, here's the, uh, the diagram for the quartic itself. And here's two invariants of the quartic. And that gives you another set of two axes that you can do to uh, tell what quartics are. This, uh, I'll just hand you, is the discriminant of the quartic, which is kind of a mess, uh, but you know, in diagrams is kind of pretty. Uh, he also did uh, uh, contravariance of the quartic, that is, uh, diagrams with uh, extra dangling p's on here. This is uh, what's called in the business the Hessian, uh, which is we'll, we'll talk about in a second here. And oops, and uh, this is another you know diagram. That's my version of what he did, like that. So this is a little bit. Uh, better represented because this has ambiguities in it. And now he gets into quintics and, you know, arcs with five things sticking out of them. And, uh, and uh, that's something I'd represent like this. Things get a little more complicated. And then um, the discriminant of that is a, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's a linear combination of these things here. And uh, then he gets into contravariance, as they call it, things with, 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 uh, with, uh, like there's 26 differences. How the hell he figured this out, I don't know. But uh, you know, they didn't have television and the internet that those days to interact, to distract you. Um, let's talk a little bit about derivatives. Let's take uh, the cubic uh, polynomial function here, which is a function of x, y, and, and w here, and that's our diagram version of that. Let's see if we can take the partial derivative of this with respect to x. What does that look like in diagram form? Well, partial derivative of just the vector x, y, w is 1, 0, 0, right? Derivative of x with respect to x and so forth. Now we remember the uh, product rule for taking the derivative of uh, products of three things is you know, derivative of the first one, derivative of the middle one, derivative of the right one equals three times, ultimately three times x squared. So in diagram form, that looks like this. Here's the derivative of the first one. Here's the derivative of the other one, derivative of that one. Since this is symmetrical, these all kind of collapse together into one diagram here, so 
This here is now the partial derivative of this with respect to x. And if we look at this, just this part of it, that vector, when dotted with 1, 0, 0, gives the partial derivative with respect to x, which means basically that that vector by itself is going to be the column vector of partial with x, partial y, and partial w. So in order to take a derivative of something, you just lop off a, lop off a node. To take a second derivative, you lop off two nodes. Uh, to do the Hessian of something, which is typically defined as take the second partial derivative of something and take its determinant, and uh, the determinant is plugged in like that. So this is the Hessian of a cubic polynomial. Uh, here's the Hessian of a quartic polynomial, which is another quartic, in fact, which is amusing for ways that I won't be able to get into today. Let's move up a dimension. Um, the Hessian of a cubic curve is the same sort of thing. You take two uh, derivatives on this thing and, and take its uh, determinant, which uh, requires two epsilons here. And so uh, that, again, the derivative of a uh, the Hessian of a cubic curve is another cubic curve, which is kind of fun. It turns out Hessians kind of deal with flatness. And what happens is, if you have a cubic curve and look at its Hessian, those two intersect at the inflection points. Now, subatomic physics. Again, physics uh, background. We have what's called the inner product, which is this tensor, you know, inner product like that. What if we did it the other way around? We get uh, backwards, and, and the rules of matrix vector multiplication are uh, this, and the outer product looks like that, which is a matrix with one arrow in and one arrow out. Uh, for example, when we said intersecting lines, we take k and l uh, uh, equal to zero, those intersect in, in space. Let's take this thing and snip the thing uh, off here and kind of flatten it out a little bit. And we, we do this as the, the dual version of that. This is now a, a vector, a, a matrix, one arrow in, one arrow out. And it turns out that that is the outer product of the plane and the point, plane containing the lines and the, and the point at the intersection. And again, if you take the trace of that matrix, uh, it's always zero because, of course, the point lies on the plane. There's different types of outer product, uh, depending if you do uh, uh, mixed or, or pure tensors, but you have to play around a little bit when you're doing uh, uh, things like this. If this is a, a, a thing like that, um, <clears throat> product, of, product of M and L, which is fine as long as you're putting the same value into here, but if you're putting different numbers on either side, you note the thing that uh, they're not the same. So if you have, uh, say, a diagram which ex expects a symmetric matrix plug into it, you have to first symmetrize this thing by Getting get the sum of the permutations, and sometimes that's denoted by putting a, 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 a ring around there representing all positive permutations. And so if we plug this into this Q now, we get uh, uh, and expand it. This, this, this will expand into two terms and two terms. So there's a total of four terms. This one is identical to zero because it's an M and M and an LL. It's not just zero, it's very zero because it's zero times zero. Likewise, this is a, that too, but the result of this thing here is ML times ML. Notice that's the point in here. So in other words, the adjugate of this matrix is the uh, outer product of the point of intersection of those two things. So we have this what's called nice nested de de degeneracies. If you have a, a quadratic function here and it's non-zero, then it's going to be rank three, so it's going to represent some, uh, some uh, quadratic uh, uh, kind of section. If you have this equal to zero, that means the rank is going to be less or equal to two, and so the adjugate of it is going to be uh, singular, and it's going to be the point of intersection, which you just said. If we have um, the adjugate being equal to zero, there's a whole zero matrix here, then we have for rank one or perhaps less, and that means that the Q is the outer product of, this is a, this is a square of a line. The two, cult, the two lines are on top of each other, and then, you know, rank zero, the whole thing is zero. So we have this kind of nested thing where we take a diagram and we keep snipping away parts of it and that gives us a sub uh, case that's even more singular. We snip on another part and the sub case is even more similar. So it's nested degeneracies like that. And uh, so analyzing cubic curves like that, so what the, the game here is we're going to take a tensor, we're going to try to write it as the combination of, uh, of uh, linear combinations of rank one tensors. And it turns out that a cubic polynomial uh, curve can always be represented as the sum of a uh, triple line and three more lines here. And the three lines will be the tangents at the interflection points, and the line will be the line through the inflection points. 
Now, if you're going to plug that into some of the things like that, you have to remember that this thing has to be symmetrized, so that kind of blows up a little bit combinatorially and uh, you know that. But what's nice about this representation is that various degeneracies can be represented in terms of the ways that these lines can be degenerate. That is, if you have uh, four independent lines, you get a kind of a general curve. If it happens so, so happens that two of them intersect each other, we get a situation where the tangents uh, are collinear. And if you have, for example, the intersection of L and M lying on K, uh, you get a degeneracy which is a curve with a loop in it. Uh, if it turns out that uh, M kind of comes down and lies on M, you get a, a, uh, a uh, thing with a cusp in it and one inflection point. And if uh, M lies uh, on top of K, then you get a, a pro pro product of a quadratic and a linear. So it's kind of a nice geometric way of, of, of interpreting or deciphering things. And one last thing here I want to get because it's pretty cool. Suppose you want to invent a vector that has uh, desired eigenvectors, a, a matrix that has three desired eigenvectors, three by three matrix. Make me one thing. Here's the three eigenvectors I'm going to do. Here's how you do it. You can write it as the outer product of these three terms here, where these are the three eigenvectors, and these are the cross product of the other two eigenvectors. And you can see immediately that that's going to work because if you imagine, uh, say, plugging a P into this thing, this gives you PSQ, which is a non zero thing, times P, like. But here we give uh, P and P in both places, and here's a P and P in both places. So the P plugging in here will immediately cancel these things out, you leaving you some scalar function of T, P, right? Now, suppose we want to do what I call exemplary transformations. That is, it turns out if you have four points in the plane, it's always possible to find a projective transformation that will map those into four other desired points. This is done with photographic rectification. There's various slightly complicated ways of doing that, but there's a the somewhat simpler way of doing that because now we can say instead of having p on the outputs uh, be the same as the, 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 the uh, eigenvalues you want, we say uh, we want those to be the outputs here of q and uh, r. So this right away works by, uh, for at least three of the points because you plug a, a p into here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this will cancel out and this will cancel out giving you now, the, the pink P, likewise for Q and R, same way as eigenvalues. We just have to come up with the values alpha, beta, and gamma that work for R now. And I'll give you the punchline. There's a derivation of this thing, but it's this. Slightly complicated looking, but if you write it like this, you can kind of see the machinery of why this works. Notice, uh, I'll just tell you if you don't notice this. Each one of these things is the same, except each one is a missing an, a, uh, an R in a different slot, okay? And these are uh, three different things. And so if you plug R into this, this now is a common factor of all these things, which factors out. And so this is, this is this times this, which, uh, again, going back to our original three diagram thing, shows that that works for R. So um, I think I'll let people uh, escape now at this point <laughs> and have some lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for a really interesting, amazing talk. Um, I think uh, because of the time, we'll, we'll let people take off, and uh, Jim can have some, some lunch. But uh, thank you so much for coming back and uh, giving a talk. Well, I got